All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for sticking here, even though I know there are some really exciting panels happening at the same time. Good news is I think they're all recording, uh, so you can always just learn everything uh, when you get home. Hi, I'm Ash. Uh, my full name is Ashkan Kazarian, but that is my mother's fault, so you can call me Ash. And today we're here to talk about trust and safety and the future of trust and safety. It's a very wide ranging topic, which is why we have an expert panel that come from very different backgrounds and uh, they work for very different organizations to hopefully cover all of the issues and solve them in an hour. Uh, I'm going to let my panelists introduce themselves. Uh, we'll just go down the line. Tell me you want to Sure. Start. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know about solving, but definitely getting to some of them. Uh, my name is Tomer. I've been at Active Fence for the past three years. Uh, Active Fence is a company that builds both software solutions, AI detection models, and kind of proactive uh, protection services for online platforms to deal with all forms of harm, specializing in kind of the more egregious topics of terror, child safety, disinfo, uh, and, uh, and uh, kind of a, but a whole wide spectrum of them. Uh, and I hope to bring today an industry perspective, both kind of from a vendor perspective, uh, working across many trust and safety teams, but not being part of one of the online platforms, making me you know, possibly a little less partial. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I'm glad to be joining this panel. Thank I'm you. I'm looking forward to hearing what's your favorite trust and safety team. Uh, <laughs> David? All right, I'll continue it on. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, David Ryan Polgar. I'm with the nonprofit based in New York called All Tech is Human. Uh, we're focused on strengthening the responsible tech movement and ecosystem so we can better tackle wicked tech and society issues like we're hearing all about today, like Section 230, uh, which was packed earlier, uh, and also so we can co-create a tech future that's aligned with the public interest. If I could underline public interest in order to align technology with the public interest, we need to have the public involved. A lot of what Alltech as Human does that I would argue, I'm biased, but I would argue is different, is that we set up a big tent strategy that gets people across civil society, government, industry, and academia all over the world who are coming together to try to tackle some of these hard issues. Uh, and we do that through three main ways of uh, multi-stakeholder convening and community building uh, with our Slack group uh, with 62 countries, 5,000 members, and then also multidisciplinary education. And then lastly, diversifying the traditional tech pipeline with more backgrounds, disciplines, and perspectives. Uh, and outside of All Tech is Human, I also sit on a bunch of boards. Uh, one relevant to this uh, would be TikTok's Content Advisory Council for the United States. Rebecca? Hi, I'm Rebecca McKinnon. Uh, I'm with the Wikimedia Foundation. We are the nonprofit organization that hosts Wikipedia and uh, about a dozen other volunteer run uh, and volunteer governed free knowledge platforms. Uh, and I am currently vice president for global advocacy. So I lead the team that advocates globally for laws and policy environments that make it possible for people to edit Wikipedia and to share knowledge across borders, which, as it turns out, um, there are, uh, you know, wrinkles being thrown at us all around the world. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, protection from uh, inter intermediary liability, preserving intermediary liability protections through Section 230 um, is, of course, very important. It protects the right of volunteers to actually set and enforce rules on the platform. So most of the content moderation is, is being done by volunteers or all of it. Um, and uh, yeah, so, uh, and, and uh, like David, um, we are trying to advocate for policymakers to think not just about who they want to punish and what the bad behavior is or how to fix the internet, but really what kind of internet do we want to create? What kind of internet will be best for open, democratic, equitable societies that everyone can participate in and everyone can fulfill their right to be educated? Um, and uh, so we need to think about what types of public policies will make that possible and how we protect the models that make that possible. So 
That's what I'm here to talk awesome. about. Awesome. On behalf of all millennials, thank you, Wikipedia, for my homework. Um, <laughs> Suzanne? Sure. I'm Suzanne Nossel, and I, I wear two hats uh, in this discussion. One is a CEO of PEN America, the free expression organization. At PEN America, we've become increasingly focused on threats to free speech online. We have significant programs working on uh, how to combat disinformation without repressing freedom of expression and how to address digital safety issues uh, in the same manner without curtailing freedom of speech. Uh, and that's, that's a, a part of the wider work that we do on free expression issues uh, here in the United States and around the world. And then on the uh, oversight board, uh, I've been, I wasn't one of the original members, but I've been on it for about a year and a half uh, as part of our effort to adjudicate tough calls uh, on content and also delve into some of the very thorny policy issues that uh, arise on Meta's platform. So looking forward to talking uh, a bit about that. I'm very excited about this panel. Let's start with the first question. Uh, the word transparency is being thrown around as the sort of get out of jail free card often um, and as a counter to regulation. Uh, some countries, European Union right now and other countries are following suit, are actually requiring transparency. Uh, so we're seeing more and more of that trend around the globe. Um, often it's the bigger tech companies that have transparency reports, but honestly, I don't think many people read or understand, aside from a couple of regulators and researchers. Uh, my question is about tra regulated and mandated transparency. Is that the way, if it's the way, like, is there a good example? Is there a bad example? What are the benchmarks that you think we should be hitting? We'll start with Rebecca, but then this is an open, ooh, this is an open question for everyone. Well, as it happens, before I came to Wikimedia, I, I ran a, a program called Ranking Digital Rights that reads transparency reports and terms of service and privacy policies, so you don't have to. And, um, you know, what's, what's interesting and what, what I've always felt is that transparency is the first step. It's not, it's a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. And what, what is the point of transparency from a human rights perspective, right? And, and, and I think if our goal is to ensure that the internet better enables and protects human rights, that that should be the purpose of transparency. And so when it comes to speech, I need to know who is manipulating what I can see and not see, who has the power to prevent me from seeing certain things, uh, or to amplify certain things that that show up in my feed. So I know what I don't know, and I know who's manipulating what I know. Um, and then I can make informed choices about it. Similarly, with data and who's accessing my data, I need to know who has the ability to access information about me and my communications under what authority and who I can hold accountable if, if that's being abused and can anybody know that it's being abused, right? And so that's, that's the first step. That's not to say that transparency should be a replacement, let's say, for strong federal <laughs> privacy law, right? I mean, it's, it's one thing to know what, uh, what's being collected about you so that you can be targeted with ads. And it's another thing to, to make sure that you're protected from discriminatory practices, right? Um, so there, there's, there's definitely, I think, a role there. Now, Wikipedia and, and other Wikimedia projects are a little bit different from, say, Facebook or something. We do um, publish transparency reports that focus primarily on government demands, what governments are demanding that we take down, um, which we we do very little of because we don't moderate the content the community does um, and uh, what data governments are requesting. And because we collect almost nothing about people, we can't really hand over much, right? Uh, and uh, so, but when it comes, I think where the real debate right now is about transparency reporting is less about what governments are demanding of companies, although I'm going to come back to that in a minute because I think actually we've started to focus too little on that. Um, and we need more government transparency about what's being demanded of companies. Um, so I hope we do come back to that. But but what's what's really the center of debate around transparency right now is what companies ought to be disclosing about content moderation. So it's less about what governments are demanding you take down 
Um, and of course, in the U.S., that's kind of moot anyway. And it's more about what are you taking down? You know, what's the nature and volume of other stuff you're taking down? Um, with Wikipedia, every edit that anybody's ever made on Wikipedia is public. You just click on the history tab of any Wikipedia page. You can also click on another tab to see all the debates about what should stay up and go down. And you can click on another tab that shows you what the rules are for that particular page or that category of context and who's kind of who's got authority to edit under what uh, ways and I, I think there's uh, a couple I won't out them at the moment but there's a few there's at least a couple Wikipedians in the room or in the building today who could show people more if people are interested but but that's all public for anybody to discover if if you want um, and so that's of course very different <laughs> from from uh, commercial platforms where th there is a real question of how much does the public need to know so that we can understand who is exercising power over our speech and under what circumstances? Absolutely. Um, do you want to go next? Sure. I'll make a few quick points. I think transparency is definitely kind of fundamental before we decide what companies need to do or don't need to do. At least we should all be uh, um, kind of privy to what they're doing. Um, and I think it's also great that unlike, you know, what we heard everything to about 230 and most topics, content moderator moderation are very partisan these days. I think transparency, one of the only issues where like, you know, who wouldn't on which side want, uh, a kind of further, uh, access to what companies are doing. So it's great that it's bipartisan and I think it has higher chances of kind of moving forward. Um, I think that transparency is very important. I could tell you, again, bringing the industry perspective, talking to trust and safety leaders that are often frustrated because they know that the efforts that they're making uh, versus their peers, maybe the additional investment, the additional headcount doesn't really translate into uh, you know, the public eye. Uh, they're not going to be seen as doing more or you know, working harder to prevent these harms, and that creates an inverse incentive to do more. Right? When no one uh, sees and their peers are going to invest a tenth and be seen as the same by the media or by the public, uh, it gives an inverse incentive to do more. Uh, the final thing I'll say, and this is kind of the perspective from ActiveFence as we monitor dark web communities and kind of just generally dark chatter uh, from hate groups, terrorist groups, child abuse groups, they're often looking at company bylaws, right, the, the kind of enforcement guidelines that moderations team have in order to bypass them, find loopholes and so on. So there is kind of a pitfall in transparency that you're giving the enemy uh, kind of more knowledge of exactly how you're yeah. behaving. So. Sounds like your company is a bad man just watching over <laughs> the dark parts of the city. Suzanne, I wanted to go to you with the same question um, with one caveat. Uh, in the U.S., there is currently some litigation, Florida case, Net Choice CCIA versus Paxton. Uh, there is this bit about the transparency requirements that were in the Florida bill that I believe was the only part of the Florida bill that both the district court and the 11th Circuit said was constitutional and like that's still not the last like we still have to hear from the supreme court if transparency requirements are constitutional but i think in the united states the first amendment work and the free speech work is slightly greatly different from let's say even europe um and so do you think when it comes to transparency regulation and requirements in the united states do you think they even will will stand the first amendment test I, you know, I do think so. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's one of the ways that you can begin to regulate here in the United States without uh, walking right into the First Amendment. So it's an easy and sort of obvious starting point. It's, it's uh, in many ways where the EU is starting. So I think if there's any hope for progress uh, I, on the regulatory front, I think it would be uh, with, with transparency. I also think, though, that we have a lot to learn. I mean, it, transparency has to be paired with intelligibility. You know, if you can't parse and understand and analyze what it is that you're getting, uh, you know, it can be virtually useless. And this is something we see with the board, just how kind of challenging that is. You really need to know what questions to ask. Transparency is in the eye of the beholder. They will say they're being very, the company will say they're being very transparent about something and will ask another question and there'll be different sorts of barriers. For example, in our, in our cross check, PAO, you know, wanting to see the list of who was on the uh, eligible and afforded cross-check, uh, you know, that was, uh, we weren't able to access that. And so I don't think it's as simple as passing a transparency 
bill. I think questions of enforcement are going to be complex. Also, a question of how you make this information meaningful for users. You know, there it is, you know, we see such an enormous kind of forfeiture of control and privacy just out of people, you know, wanting access, wanting to move forward, not wanting to trouble themselves with all of these really nettlesome questions about what the long-term consequences might be of being on these services, uh, undertaking certain activities, you know, for convenience reasons. And so, you know, how do we kind of balance that out? I don't think we could just assume you put this in the hands of users and they're going to radically reshape, uh, you know, how they how they operate. Um, and I think, you know, the other challenge is, is as these systems become more sophisticated, uh, it just it's just going to be harder and harder, I think, to know what questions to ask and to digest what we get back, you know, on something, for example, like generative AI, you know, what it means to really have transparency when it comes to, you know, how that's sourced and, uh, you, know, you know, what its effects are. So spoiler alert, we're definitely going to talk about AI in a bit. Um, we're also going to have the room really filled out. It makes me feel great, so thank you, everyone. Um, we're going to have a, a good chunk of time for Q&A, so please stick around. So David, uh, your organization is Old Tech is Human, and uh, so when I think about transparency through that lens, I think of honesty. Yes. So what do you think about honesty, tech companies, transparency, and regulation? Well, sunlight is the best disinfectant. I think that's what we, we need right now. Uh, one of the side effects sometimes of sitting on boards outside of All Tech is Human is that you get a lot of really strongly worded letters, strongly worded uh, emails to you. But also by being surrounded by people's pain points, it allows you to understand different experiences. And the experience that a lot of people who are not sitting in this room have is that they feel the weight of the decisions. So on one hand, we frame social media as if it's a luxury. It's not a, it's not a kind of human right. But a lot of individuals it's very central to their expression and oftentimes central to their livelihood or their financial livelihood. So the transparency is essential in the sense that you have to ensure, and even if you take it through a free expression type of lens, that decisions are not done in an arbitrary and capricious fashion. That's how we normally would think about something like free speech when, you, when you're constructing a, a statute is to make sure that you and another individual are treated the same. We're, we're the same under the law or else it's, it's biased. And I think when, when I back up and, and think about my uh, exposure to a diverse range of people uh, through All Tech is Human, what it's really kind of caused me to, to, to learn is that the public's relationship to social media is not like a consumer business relationship. They are viewing social media as if it's a quasi-governmental body. We can argue all we want about that, and I'm sure we can. However, that's also because people like Elon Musk frame it in that way by calling it a public square. And when you think about a public square, you say, my God, well, then I should have three co-equal branches of government. And then you have accountability and transparency. Everything we're talking about in a well-functioning democracy is now where this argument is going with social media, social media democracy, if you will. So Suzanne, who sits on the oversight board, when the oversight board was launched, when Zuckerberg was talking about it in April uh, 2018, it, it got picked up in the media as the, the Supreme Court. Well, that's very intentional, the way we're thinking about it, because we are thinking that somebody needs to interpret the laws, somebody needs to make the laws, Right? And somebody needs to kind of carry them out. So if you don't have that, then you would be a democratically challenged country where you would have the judge, jury, and executioner kind of done in a hierarchical type of fashion. That's the friction point that a lot of the general public has towards social media platforms is that they're saying, well, okay, you told me that I offended something on the community guidelines or terms of service, but aren't you the ones who are making the law and then you can change the law and then you're interpreting the law and then you're executing it? And that in itself can be problematic. They're, they're expecting some separation between the two, and that's where you know, I, I am very bullish on the intentions behind the oversight board of saying, well, we need to segregate this because, again, we're, it, social media is currently a, <laughs> a private business, but our relationship to it is not of a private business, and that's, that's a big 
big point that I want to underline. Yeah, Professor Jack Balkin actually writes about this. He says that there's a fiduciary duty mm -hmm. between tech companies and platforms and its users. So I, I see the direction you're going. Since you've talked about the oversight board, I'm going to go to Suzanne next. Suzanne, let me know if I need to call you your honor or your justice, since you're of a Supreme <laughs> Court. Um, <laughs> Uh, but you've been on the board for almost two years. Uh, do you think in general these third party bodies are a silver bullet or maybe a, at least a partial answer to the trust and safety shortcomings? There are other examples of this. There's the digital trust and safety partnership that took up uh, that is a you know, very exciting uh, new venture that also was trying to kind of organize and be this independent body that gets more transparency and like better understanding and coordination between tech companies of different sizes. Uh, what is your experience in all of this? Yeah, sure. I was going to talk just a little bit about kind of the oversight board and, and uh, a few areas where I think it can contribute and sort of, and what the limitations are. I, mean, I joined and have always viewed it as very much of an experiment. Um, I'd say after two plus years, the results are not all in, but we can see, begin to see some patterns. Uh, and I, you know, I'll highlight four positives, each of which has a big caveat. Um, you know, the first is really what you were touching on, which is offering this kind of reasoned jurisprudence for hard cases. You know, questions like, can you call for death to the supreme leader of Iran on the platform? You know, is that, uh, should that be protected? You know, should you be able to uh, put unsubstantiated accusations of attacks on civilians in Ethiopia when those might pr uh, provoke reprisals? Uh, you know, what about uh, questions of nudity based on gender or transgender identity? Like really, you know, honestly thorny questions and we go about it in this, uh, you know, very rational way and we apply human rights law and it's thoughtful and there's an opinion. And, you know, my feeling is like, whether you agree with the opinion or not, it matters less than that somebody went through the exercise of coming up with a rationale which never existed before. I mean, that was completely inaccessible before, uh, and it offers a degree of predictability. Now, you know, what's the limitation? Well, you know, we've dealt with, uh, you know, some dozens of cases, uh, you know, out of the enormous ocean. Now, not all of those cases and appeals really raise those novel issues, and it's actually been a process for us to try to hone in on those that do. In the beginning, we would take some cases that actually, when you got right down to it, because we don't have lower courts, so nobody's distilling the issues. And sometimes we would get to the bottom and find actually there's no real debate here. Uh, and, and Facebook also makes a lot of enforcement errors. So oftentimes we'll go to them, uh, you know, with a case and say, provide us with your rationale for what you did. And they say, oops, you know, it was just an error, uh, an automated error, a human error. Uh, and that uh, sort of voids it out. So that's piece, piece one in terms of our value and uh, uh, kind of the, the limitation of that. Second is really our ability to probe and shed light into what the company uh, does. Uh, you know, and I'll give this example of, you know, we're now uh, working on a, a policy advisory opinion on COVID misinformation. It's, and, you know, we're, you sort of get to the bottom of how they've actually handled that and how it's changed over time. And when the opinion comes out, uh, everybody will be able to learn some of what we did, it, you know, with the PAO on cross-check. Uh, you know, there were pieces of information we didn't get, but there was also an enormous amount that we did learn that honestly was surprising about how the system worked, kind of a two-tiered system, and that those who are beneficiaries of the system have their content remain up on the platform, even when it's found to be violating, while it goes through a whole sequence of appeals and during its peak period of virality. So, you know, it, it is a, a, a large loophole that I think a few of us, and you know, myself included, uh, didn't understand well. So, uh, you know, there's there's great value, and, and we have the ability to ask questions, to make recommendations, to get them to respond to those. So, I do think it's something that you know we need to take advantage. We take that responsibility seriously. Uh, you know, at the same time, they remain a private company, and ultimately, they dispose of our requests. Uh, some of them they accede to, some of them they don't. Uh, and, and you know, where they don't, uh, we don't necessarily have much recourse. Uh, that'll get me to the fourth thing. You know, the third is our ability to drive policy changes, and I think there have been some uh, important ones. Uh, they have to respond to all of our recommendations. We always state in our recs what it would take for us to consider the recommendation fulfilled. Uh, so they've accepted a bunch of our recommendations on cross-check, including 
the kinds of uh, users who are going to be eligible for protection under the system. They've just reevaluated re and reissued their strikes policy to make that more transparent and kind of less punitive. They've adopted a new crisis protocol. They've done a lot more on translation. So there are a lot of concrete things that they've actually done in our response, in response to those uh, recommendations. But ultimately, again, you know, it's up to them. And there are important things we suggest that they don't do. I'll just say the last one, which is our ability as a board to spur regulators and other players. And I think this is, you know, sort of the next frontier for things that we can't accomplish. Can we be kind of a springboard for those who have uh, power, powers beyond what we do to see what needs to be done and to use their authority to achieve it. I will disagree with you on the fact that I think you have a power when they don't want to enforce. Um, it's like this an analogy would be like ringing the bell and screaming shame. I think the just the publicity of Facebook not complying with something the oversight board recommended I think is a good enforcement mechanism for what it's worth. Yes, Rebecca. Yeah, um, I just want to add something. Um, one, of, one of the things that I found so meaningful about the Oversight Board's work is the application of international human rights law, universal human rights standards, to the actions of, global, of a global platform, but also in the U.S. context. So I remember when the, when the ruling on the Trump deplatforming decision uh, came out, and that analysis based on international universal human rights standards for kind of what the implications were um, was really important because I, I think one, one experience I've had just in, in working with folks from Silicon Valley is that um, especially like 10, 10 or so years ago, when I would go to meetings with people in Silicon Valley, I'd mention international human rights standards. People didn't even know what they were. Um, and, and so the, the fact that we now have the oversight board making very clear, detailed rulings on how you apply human rights law to the platforms is really significant. And while in the US, because of the First Amendment, there's nothing the US government can do in Europe, Actually, you know, human rights law is being used as the basis for a lot of regulation and the regulation that holds up to challenge. And so when you have an analysis that shows ways in which a platform is failing to protect human rights of users in accordance with international human rights standards, that potentially has a regulatory impact globally that, that can't be ignored, um, even if there's no direct application here now, but it can also be used as a way for other stakeholders, investors, um, and others to, to, to hold platforms accountable. David? Yeah, I, I think we know how difficult these decisions are, right? One of the early cases kind of preceding the oversight board uh, dealt with, you know, Facebook kind of getting in uh, political kind of trouble for, for taking down uh, Napalm Girl, right? If you just view that on its face, that's an underage uh, naked female. But because of its political significance, it's something obviously we'd want to protect and political speech being kind of more central. The point I'm trying to underline is that speech is nuanced and speech is complex. Even when we think about the thoughtfulness that goes behind the oversight board, one of the things that I would like to just kind of emphasize is I think one of the Achilles heel uh, of social media that, that we can never seem to get over is that social media platforms or just when you think about startup ethos, it's always on, like, talk to a startup person. They're always concerned with scalability. And even when we think about the, the founding of a lot of these social media platforms, it was based on this kind of hockey stick growth and scalability. Speech is the antithesis of scalability. And I think now we're reaching this friction point where we see that speech takes a lot of time and energy and nuance. To go back to the strongly worded emails that I'm sure we all receive, the misconception that the general public has is they say, my God, why did this get taken down? 
Why am I being penalized? Didn't you look at three posts before and understand the context? And didn't you see the poster behind me and its reference? Didn't you know that? Didn't you do your research? Didn't you go to Wikipedia and read something? And you say, well, have you done the stats about how quickly content moderation decisions are made? It's, it's, it's merely seconds, right? So how can a thoughtful decision be made in a, in a framework that is based on scalability? And obviously AI has not Good proven... Good for the yeah. AI question. <laughs> yeah. I will, yeah, we're going to go straight into AI, but I do want to say that David has an article that's called What If Tech Companies Were Nonprofits? So I, I could feel some of those themes here. So I recommend everyone read it. Um, so let's talk about AI. AI has been at the top of mind uh, this year, partially because there's a Supreme Court case about algorithmic recommendations and if it's protected by Section 230 or not. There are three different panels today on Section 230, so we're going to try and, like, talk about other things. But this is all related, obviously. Um, when is when is it okay? Like, what is the line? When can you use AI? Because obviously there is not enough people on the planet to moderate the content we have on current platforms, let alone on the platform that maybe pops up tomorrow. Um, so where do you see the line? Where do you see kind of the correct use and incorrect use? Should there be a human moderator checking what are the cases for that? Just in general, how would you see AI operate within this? And obviously, it's already being employed. Um, Tom, yeah, you? so, I mean, Act Defense builds a, a lot of AI solutions. And, you know, just to frame it, we're talking specifically about AI for content moderation. As David said, it's extremely hard, especially considering context for, you know, algorithms to make decisions on what's right or not. Um, I do feel like AI is improving to a level that it's able to take into consideration a lot of the context. Like you mentioned, did you see what I wrote in my previous post? Did you see the picture behind me? Do you see the org that I'm a part of? Uh, do you see who my network? All these things are currently you know, more and more being considered by AI. Um, what we put a lot of emphasis in the AI tools that we provide is explainability, right? Uh, showing why the AI decided what it did because of something in minutes two and 10 uh, that this person was saying or doing or the gun that he was holding up or whatever that is, we're trying to give moderators as much context as possible so the moderation decision can still happen in a few seconds but it has a lot of this context and a lot of this data presented to the moderator so they can make the most informed decision, granted that there are many mistakes that are going to be made. Where we see uh, a lot of kind of where does AI fail generally, we see it when there is kind of novel current events, geopolitics involved, you know, which is a lot of the areas of misinformation. We see it when there are, uh, and this is probably more predominantly, when bad actors are involved, right? The bad actors, uh, you know, not the 15-year-old saying something racist in a chat group, but actually a neo-Nazi trying to recruit, a pedophile trying to groom, wherever those kind of instances, folks that are on these platforms in order to cause harm, they are uh, sophisticated, they are keen in terms of understanding uh, how your AI and how your algorithms are detecting, and they are constantly poking at the system to find out how what they can get away with and how. Those are the cases where platforms can't just lean on AI and need to deploy, you know, uh, either kind of means of other means of protecting their users, whether it's through. Uh, you know, investigations, and you see a lot of these departments form up in trust and safety departments. I mean, just in the several years that I've been in the industry, I feel like the amount of folks coming from three-letter agencies uh, and folks with experience in kind of counterintelligence coming into the trust and safety industry, because the industry understands that you're dealing with an adversary. And when you have an adversary, AI alone is going to break. Suzanne, do you want to talk about AI and content moderation? What are your thoughts? You know, I mean, I, I, you know, we certainly deal with a lot of automated content moderation uh, that's very flawed, and we deal with a lot of human content moderation that's very flawed, and oftentimes the same piece of content will go through multiple layers of review with indeterminate results, and there are kind of mistakes along the way. I mean, it's, it, it's incredibly buggy. Like, I hope you're right that it is going to be honed over time. And I can imagine that, you know, like 
for detecting, you know, changes in, uh, you know, a, a bodily organ, uh, whether they're early signs of cancer, that ultimately, like, it's easy to understand why AI ultimately would be better at that. I mean, they could just incorporate millions and millions of data points to see whether the most subtle changes might be indicative of anything. And I, th- I you know, I could sort of see some of the same, but I also think it really calls for robust and uh, immediate appeals processes because it's just an error is inevitable. I mean, there are, you know, there are words that have multiple meanings. There are words that have uh, different meanings in different dialects. All of those subtleties, you know, we have to get into. We have to have uh, interpreters, um, you know, often several of them for the same piece of content to sort of explain, uh, you know, how the meaning uh, might be a little bit different for different communities. And so, you know, how long it's going to take for these systems to integrate that level of sophistication, I think, is a big question. And there's, there's, you know, obviously great scope for error in the meantime. And there's also sort of the faith we place in in AI and I think the risk of kind of over-deference to those systems. Rebecca? Yeah, I think we need to be careful when we're talking about content moderation and, of course, automated systems in relation to content moderation to not just talk about content moderation as this as if it's one model, right? So you all are talking about content moderation done by large commercial platforms that are kind of general purpose. People go on them to share pictures of cats, organize a revolution, anything in between, right? Um, and and there, there are people who are paid to moderate the contents. The rules are set up by the company. With Wikipedia and other Wikimedia projects, it's a very different model where you have a very specific purpose of the platform that volunteers have come together to create, and they've set rules around what is reliable, what are reliable sources for, for well-sourced neutral content on whether it's COVID-19 or a historic event or whatever. Uh, and it's the community that's enforcing that. So it's, it's, it's not paid moderators. It's, it's people who tend to actually have some expertise or kind of be a, from or adjacent to a language community or a cultural community that the content relates to. And people have debates. And, you know, you were just talking about, you know, you know, but what about, you know, didn't you see my other post? Right. And, you know, mm-hmm. the, 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 the community, the volunteer editors are all kind of pointing to the context of this and what did they actually mean and, you know, what, what's its purpose and, and kind of looking at that context and making decisions, right? And you can do that when you have a platform that's for a more specific purpose, um, whose community has some general consensus about what the purpose of the platform is. And so the reason why I'm going into all this detail is because I'm concerned that when policymakers start talking about legislation around automated content moderation or content moderation in general, they're only going to be thinking about what you all are talking about. They won't be thinking at all about content moderation models such as Wikipedia's and and then policies will get made and laws will be passed that will be quite harmful to to the communities that have set up platforms for public interest purposes. And I, I just going to the the machine learning and, and AI piece for, for a moment, you know, people um, in in sort of the accountable AI space talk about the need for humans in the loop all the time. We talk about a machine in the loop because the content moderation is always controlled by humans from start to end. But we use, but but the but the moderators, the volunteers, lean on some machine learning tools to help them detect sort of abusive behavior on particular pages or what's known as sock pocket puppeting when people are creating multiple accounts. And so there are some machine learning tools that are used to help Wikipedians maintain the integrity of the content, but it's always with the humans in control. And the, the models for these things are discussed with the community. It's open source code. It's, it's very openly developed and shared. So I, I guess what... My point here is that we need to make sure, as we're developing public policy, as we're talking about what the trends are, again, to envision what we'd like to support, 
what we, you know, if, if we want communities to be able, you know, let, let's say, you know, a, a community around, you know, a university wants to set up something around that's very specifically for dealing with the environment in their community. They want to set rules that are very related to their community's environmental issues. They want to have their own enforcement mechanisms. Um, they want to use some machine learning tools to in, enforce, you know, to, to do their content moderation, that we're not setting laws and regulations that actually make that harder. Absolutely. So time flies when you're having fun. Um, so I'm going to do one more question before we go to audience questions. Uh, Rebecca, you mentioned government uh, interacting with platforms and sometimes Joe bonding them. Uh, there was actually a hearing, I think, a few weeks ago that was very entertaining. I highly recommend you watch it if you want to hear what Trump admin, which Chrissy Teigen tweet did Trump admin ask Twitter to take down? Google it. Um, I can't say it on air. Uh, but uh, what do you think should be... So there's actually, I think, a bill right now um, that kind of ties it to the Hatch Act and just limits, basically says that you can, using your government power in general, just being a government official, um, have this playing the refs situation power over platforms and what they take down on it, what they keep up. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think maybe we can stop this? Maybe we should have like a public database that says, French government asked us to take this meme of Macron down or something like that. Um, we'll start with you, David, and then we'll go this way. Well, I think this is uh, what, the reason why we're talking about a splinter net and, and just how do you have these kind of uh, platforms that don't have a border, but then we're still kind of confined in where they start from. And obviously we, we know a lot of the debate even going on with different uh, different social media platforms and their, and their origin. Uh, I think this is where we're kind of at a pivotal moment right now in society of deciding, are we going to take a global approach with this or is it going to be dramatically different country from country of how they're going to uh, create kind of uh, restrictions around it? Um, I think the, the biggest part that's going to happen over the next couple, uh, couple years is one of the things that I didn't hear in the earlier discussions around Section 230 that I attended was really just this shift of power and what that's going to mean, right? If you really think about the last uh, decade of, of shifting power that traditionally was confined with governmental bodies now going to uh, social media platforms, but at the end of the day, it wasn't a power grab. The platforms just want to sell you ads, right? Uh, or the major social media platforms Some that we're referring to. Some of them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the major ones, uh, yeah, that we're referring to, not the kind of more social purpose. So that in itself it leads to some of the complexity of even how we think about this. Uh, but, the, but the larger point is going to be, where do, we, where do we take this? Is this something where government is now going to get more embedded within each, each of these major, if we're talking about something like Meta or, or TikTok or Twitter or Snap or Roblox, uh, you name it? Uh, or is it something where it's a clear kind of separation between the two? I think that's going to be the kind of struggle that I'm seeing. Yeah, the quasi-jurisdiction. Rebecca? Well, you know, English Wikipedia is the same all over the world, right? It's not different in the UK and in the United States. Um, Even the spelling? Uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, <laughs> one way, you know, it doesn't change what, depending on what, I, I, you know, ISP you're using. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so it, it's, it's problematic. I mean, we're, we're dealing right now with the online safety bill in, in the United King, Kingdom, um, which uh, wants us to age gate or, you know, the, the current proposed wording would force all platforms, and it doesn't really differentiate between any Larger, types of yeah. platforms. Um, it would force platforms to age verify users before visiting. And also, you know, at, at least in terms, of, while for adults, um, it's only requiring takedown of, unlawful, con illegal content for children, there's, there's this whole category of lawful but harmful content that, that uh, platforms are, are supposed to be proactively removing. And basically, it will break our model. And it's not like we can do one thing, you know, 
the global community of people who edit Wikipedia, who are English speakers all over the world, right? Like, how are you going to? Like, it just doesn't work, right? Um, so this is this is one of the problems, um, and um, but but the other the other thing is is that, and we encounter this with a lot of governments and democratic governments who say, well, we're trying to solve this problem in our country, and it's a big issue in our country, and we're sympath sympathetic to many of the problems, but, you know, you saw, first of all, you know, there's a question of whether what you want to do is even going to solve the problem in your country, plus it's basically going to mean that it would, if we were to comply, which we won't, um, it, it would force us to collect data on users that could then be discoverable in other jurisdictions, right, where, where you, you know, in, in any case, in any country, you're one bad election away from some really awful things happening to people's data pretty much anywhere. So um, I guess the point being is that this is where I come back to holding governments accountable. And we need accountability and transparency by any Democrat, any government that claims to be, democratic. be in the business yeah. of protecting its citizens' rights. We need... We need transparency around what's being required. We need clear accountability around that. Um, and we're not seeing that. And, and when you get to things like network shutdowns, where governments are demanding that ISPs kind of shut down the internet in large swaths of you know, entire provinces or entire cities, and in India is the biggest culprit, the ISPs aren't even allowed to tell their users why the internet was shut down or that it's being shut down, right? Um, and and that kind of lack of transparency and lack of <clears> accountability <throat> with citizens around why people's access to information is being restricted, that's even in democracies, right. that's highly problematic. Or developing democracies. Uh, I think at UNESCO in Paris a month ago, they were talking about how Turkey keeps designating journalists as terrorists. Uh, Suzanne, PEN America does a lot of great work trying to fight back on government limiting speech. So I feel like this question about government and transparency when government officials are, you know, trying to twist the arm of platforms is a great one for you. Yeah, look, I think it's a huge uh, area of concern. And, you know, what we have some degree of transparency reporting about formal requests for takedowns, I think there's a whole layer of less formal interactions that happen with the big platforms that we know very little about. And, you know, part of it are, are governments that are pointing out content that violates the platform's own terms of service, but doing that at scale so that that content gets pulled down fast and furious and preemptively just to keep things on good terms where, you know, critics and dissidents, uh, you know, are not subject to the same kind of protection. And so, you know, to me, when you talk about transparency, it's not just about the data. It's about how those relationships work. And, you know, it's about people who worked in these companies who have things to tell us uh, about, you know, the, the nature of that cooperation and collaboration. And, you know, it's complicated because there's some areas where you think, you know, it may be necessary on national security grounds, uh, you know, to deal with disinformation on this country. You know, that has been a debate. You know, should there be more interaction uh, and, and even cooperation? Uh, and obviously, you know, there are obvious dangers with that. I think everybody's, you know, they've kind of come close to the brink of trying to facilitate that. And it does happen, uh, but also a, an enormous amount of leeriness, also how it can come back to bite politically. And, you know, one of the really interesting things has been how you know, this perception of anti-conservative bias has fueled legislation. I mean, you're talking about what's happening in the UK. I mean, what about Texas? If that mm -hmm. law stands, you know, what's, you know, will there be a Wikipedia or for that matter, uh, you know, a, a Facebook in Texas, because it'll be, a, uh, yeah, a very different uh, set of rules. I mean, we haven't, I haven't heard at this conference any discussion about, you know, it seems like the one legislative proposal that's getting the most traction right now is to ban TikTok. And I know they're one of the sponsors of this conference, but that, uh, you know, the, the, that, that is, uh, you know, gotten an enormous amount of uh, momentum over the last couple of months. So, you know, how you get at it, I don't think the traditional, trans the way we think about transparency actually does not shine 
a light uh, in these particular corners and corridors. And I think, you know, that's something that we need to focus on. And it is something we're discussing as an oversight board. So I just want to see how many questions we have. We have like about 10 minutes left. So, oh my God. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take them two at a time and then my panelists can address whichever they want. Um, let's go Baron and you. Uh, Baron Zobo to Freedom. Uh, for, as I showed the MLP circuit, first allowed to place transparency rules. But we and others have asked the court to what you can. So there seems to be a lack of clarity if you're lying from case law. We are too much detail. It's just out here whether it applies in some context of advertising to as why controversial statements. There were reasons to think why trans analysy that uh, Republicans and Democrats could be agree upon uh, isn't actually constitution. So uh, I'd just love to hear your panel's thoughts about what, what it is you think are quite key constitutional. Simon Collins, uh, the social media uh, court of uh, fortune, January 6th committed that the court was never included. Right? That was something that was a complete five Washington Post trials. Uh, and uh, with that base clear, is that it be the real jaw of like, what's happening here uh, is that the social media platforms have bent over backwards from the way they're forcing their votes crucially because they've been seeing what they've advised against our public. All comes to the ones to and a speech and this information. So we all know that's the case. It's not an accident that the public is weapon of this discourse around transparency because they doubt that the war of the inherency that you have the companies the more the companies will bend their way upwards not to a content. So the words transparency, well, but C separate from content moderation, is so deeply at night that it's created even more reasons than the first elected is lack of debate. The government, whether it's for a war for some federal law, to get at law to be weaponless against uh, court judgments in this way. And the second question was? <laughs> we're just going to two at a time. We're going we're gonna to cluster them. What was your question? Non to therapies B and the easy not to repent thing. Um, I wanted to go back to what uh, Suzanne was talking about in terms of the application of the human rights framework, the international human rights framework, on the uh, uh, the ruling in Sweden over safe war and how that makes for additional legislation domestically and how that um, really influences the regulation around the world so that you have this kind of bitter national human rights framework being uh, used into domestic national law by a technical oversight board. And I just wanted to see if it had any examples of that. So any kind of keys into your ruling that now the are creating the codified. So Rebecca, Suzanne, you want to take us away? Well, it, it, I mean, the Digital Services Act in, in the European Union cites international human rights law. Um, I believe in, in a number of places. As, I'm, I'm not talking about U.S. law, but 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 in Europe, um, international human rights law and and um, um, also European human rights standards are frequently cited and and codified in in a range of different ways. Yeah, there are some individual court cases that have cited oversight board opinions. I can't rattle them off, but it is something that we look at and that has happened. So, uh, you know, I think it's it's sort of the, the juridical mind is being applied to these questions. And when other jurists look at them, you know, they want to see, uh, you know, where the board has come out of it. But, you know, something we thought about in our nudity case, because that's a case that, you know, has been the subject of uh, many court decisions in different jurisdictions. And so we you know, we're definitely thinking about the fact that, you know, we were kind of weighing in on in, 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 uh, in that arena. Right, so I saw some more questions there. Oh, sorry, maybe, David, sorry, sorry yeah, David Tomer. Yeah, maybe just one comment, because I can't really comment on what would, con what would be constitutional and what wouldn't under any kind of regulation that's passed. What I'd like to bring is, I think, something that I didn't hear too much in this panel and all the 230 talks is what's happening in the field when there is absolutely no protection for what kind of trust and safety measures and means and processes platforms have to have in place, and when there's no transparency on reporting what those means are, what we're seeing now in the past, you know, not six to nine months of recession is that these companies are thinking much more cost effective, cost efficiencies, and these departments are getting cut, slashed, if not gutted by, you know, 
whoever is buying them or, or whoever owns them, right? When there is no, so you could definitely point at a lot of things, adverse effects from any kind of regula regulation that would come in for transparency or what process, procedural regulation. But de facto, what's happening in the field is, I feel, should be a concern to every American citizen, every citizen around the world right now. Yeah, I was just going to say one thing about your point about transparency. I think it's very interesting. I mean, it's something that we're seeing at PEN America in, a, in the offline arena, which is uh, transparency laws, for example, about what's going on in schools, requiring teachers to post all of their syllabi and their curriculum and all their readings online. And it's like, oh, well, it's just transparency. But why is it being done? Of course, it's being done to empower people who may object, people who uh, you know are, are self-appointed police for these now curriculum restriction laws. And so, you know, I think it's a, it, it is something that we have to, you know, we have to be attentive to as sort of a, a community that's accustomed to being all in favor of transparency. Well, this goes to, you know, what is the purpose of transparency? Is it an end to itself or is it a means to an end? Right. And, and if it's in service of civil liberties and human rights or is it in service of something else? Maybe, and, and it can maybe dual use. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yep, exactly. Let's, let's get some more questions. Yeah, Cave, Barry Burnick uh, with the National Science Foundation Center of Art and the Arts. Uh, I kind of had a bold human rights question, actually. Uh, kind of to Dover's point, but I was curious about these conversations not including uh, more discussion about content moderation as uh, an industry that's outsourced to lower communities. And I think a lot of reforging has called it what digital port shots. Um, I'm interested in uh, the kind of responsibility that's required to wrap large universal survivors uh, to be accountable for that, especially as these programs need gutted uh, within the, our country and then probably in the further outsourced and uh, if there should be in a national law or uh, actual term policies that kind of govern uh, this very exploitative process of protections for the disorders. That's a great question. And it's, you know, I think the most recent reporting was about open AI. So it's not even, you know, the big tech. Oh, everyone uses BPOs from, mm -hmm. you know, small companies that have 50 moderators to giant platforms with 50,000. Well, I think this just goes back to the scalability, right? Because the reason why it's outsourced is to save money. But if we actually took the thoughtfulness and it was more, let's say it was American based, uh, the expenses start adding up. I mean, you've seen that early on a few years ago with every time there was a controversy at Facebook, they would say, hey, we're going to hire more moderators. We're going to hire more moderators. But just start doing the math. Think about how many moderators we would need, how many human moderators, and then take out a calculator. It's going to add up to a lot of money. And we've seen the tech downturn recently. So no, no company is immune. So I think that's a larger issue. So I think you're referring to like Casey Newton's uh, work or maybe before that Sarah T. Roberts, who's done a lot of great uh, work in this kind of content, a commercial content moderation type of uh, field. But no, I, I, I do think they have a responsibility. The, the larger point is the social media founders didn't get into this to get into content moderation, but they found themselves knee deep in complex speech issues where everyone hates them and it's coming from the left and it's coming from the right. And then to, to talk about Boris's earlier point, you even have the complexity now where people are trying to work the refs and that's its own issue. I think the, the larger question is the, the governmental bodies are gonna have to decide, okay, are they separate? Or is this something where, where government's going to have to become a lot more embedded into the system, which is why you referred to kind of like an earlier article about should social media platforms be nonprofit and just this larger concept that we're expecting platforms, uh, the major platforms. Uh, we know Wikipedia is in the public interest, but for other ones like TikTok and, and, and Snapchat and, and, and Twitter, we're expecting them now to be in the public interest, to care about the well-being of, of children, and we know that mental health, we're in a mental health crisis, but how do you have a, a private business that's trying to maximize, right, the, the profits to shareholders? Now it's a natural tension, as we've seen. Well, the, the thing is, uh, so um, the global aspect of it is also that you need to have local moderators to understand the local language and the region's issues. So it's, it's the balance there. We are running out of time and we have a hard stop. So I'm going to go from Suzanne down and give every, each of my wonderful panelists 30 seconds to like for final thoughts, plug in your 
your Twitter, your Mastodon, your company? <laughs> Suzanne, let's start with you. I'll just plug my uh, article in the Wall Street Journal where I said there's, there's no quick fix for social media uh, a few weeks ago. And I think, you know, that's the bottom line. I mean, these things are really messy. I would, I would just say stay in touch with the board because we do have certain abilities that are quite unique. And if uh, there's a way we can link up to your work, uh, let us know, and we would love to have that dialogue. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say, look, um, let's think about the kind of internet we want to have, mm -hmm. um, and you know, beyond just punishing the bad things we don't like. Um, and let's get away from thinking we can fix the internet. Saying we can fix the internet is saying like we can fix crime in New York City. <laughs> Maybe you could, but you'd become Pyongyang. There's a reason we don't want New York City to be Pyongyang. And if you want to have rules and enforcement of rules that are appropriate, you know, that respect the rights of the communities that they're in. It's like policing debates. You know, ne they never end. They will never end mm -hmm. as long as humans are human. Let's hope they will remain human. And, and you know, and similarly, we, we're not going to solve content moderation as long as humans are human. But there are models that for some communities work, seem to be working better than others. So let's try and empower and protect those things that are working, that are creating good in the world, that are valued. And we're going to continue fighting till the end of time. David. All right. In my life, I get to deal with a lot of the worst of humanity, but a lot of the, the best of humanity. So it's something to point out is that you might strongly disagree with people on stage, but you should because the future technology is intertwined with future democracy and the human condition. That is a big deal that is worth fighting and disagreeing about. But that's where we come together and that even though we disagree on the surface, underneath it, we know that the status quo is not sustainable and that in order to co-create this tech future that is aligned with our interests, we need to come together in some manner. So you can do that. All take a human. We've got a Slack group. Lots of ways to get involved. Uh, thank you. Yeah, just definitely agree with a lot of things that have been said on this panel, and I do think that we're always going to be fighting, and it's impossible to fix, uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try, and I think Section 230 has been kind of uh, static for 26 years since it was founded. Uh, so doing things and experimenting and even breaking things, right, like was said in, in previous 230 panels and understanding what we broke and trying to fix them, I think that's the path, that's the roadmap to uh, creating a better internet, mm -hmm. perhaps not fixing it. Uh, so that's what I know I would like to see. And, and again, I, I think spotlighting the, uh, the decision of inaction is, uh, is also dangerous because of what we're seeing today with there's no protection for any of these departments or you know, companies could cut all of trust and safety tomorrow and not face any accountability. So it's okay. also not good. Everyone, thank you for coming. Join me in thanking the panel.